welcome to Web Ecology here on WMR.FM. It is the 2nd of March, 2023. This is uh, Jim Hedger from Digital Always Media and Christine Schackinger from Site, Sites Without Walls. And um, it has been a, a really busy week in search. There was uh, a, the first, well, the first of the big, major, major granddaddy festivals, PubCon happened, PubCon Austin happened. It was the first one since... Uh, mostly since uh, the, the COVID pandemic started winding down. Um, a number of other things happened in search. We have a busy show today. We have uh, three different guests coming on, two coming on um, very quickly to talk about uh, a Facebook ban. That's a little bit weird. And we have Tom Wrestling from Authority Key coming on uh, to talk about Authority Key. Told you he was coming Audience. up this week. Audience Key. Audience Told you he was coming up this week. Uh, really looking forward to having Tom on the show. And um, we should just jump right in. Christine, you were in Austin, Texas earlier this week, um, at least doing the social part of PubCon. How was it? Oh, I had a great time. It was very full. A lot of uh, people we've known for a really long time uh, were there. Uh, we, I went only to the events. I didn't go to the conference itself. But I really enjoyed myself. It was so good to see everybody after being in this pandemic stuff for the last three years. So it was very nice. Absolutely. And just, just so the audience knows, we did try to get a press pass for Christine, but unfortunately, um, in his wisdom, Brett only wants to, Brett Tabke, the organizer of PubCon, only wants to issue press conferences before uh, uh, a show, not during a show, because he really wants to promote the show beforehand, um, doesn't really see value promoting the great content that comes from the shows during the shows, but I think he's <laughs> wrong about that. But that's just uh- Brett. I think he did. I think he did have some people, but he only had a few. So he had, he had already decided who those few were at that time. So yeah. Nevertheless, we were there um, talking to people, getting information, and uh, setting up interviews for the future. So we did our job. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for that, Christine. Okay. Tons of stuff happened in the in the last week. I want to try to race through some really important stuff for uh, for digital marketers. Um, we uh, again, we have. Um, guests coming up in the a number of guests coming up throughout the show so it's going to be a bit of a juggling act um first one that that, that really had me that, that, that you, know, you know christine when 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 you make the mistake of of saying to your client look i got all these great indicators and i, I can tell you straight up that your you, your site is going to be doing amazing just give it a week or so right and then sure. the week passes and everything like you know tanks goes to heck and uh, didn't go as amazing as you said it would no, that hate. never happens to me. But and that happens a lot. <laughs> it happens to every SEO. I'm teasing, I'm teasing. It happens to every SEO, and it happened to Bing this year. Yeah. Bing came out with this great new technology. This is this, this this brilliant new um uh, integration of, of 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 the OpenAI product ChatGPT in with its search engine, and um maybe they should have tested it a bit more because they've had to pull back fairly substantially because as we've covered in the last couple of weeks. Um, its chatbot kind of went psychotic. So um, in 25 words or less, Christine, well, how did it pull back? Uh, how did it pull back? Well, actually, I'm not sure of all the details. So I don't think they've given a lot of details. They're just saying that uh, they are going to have less hallucinations and more responses. Nope. So for those that don't know, in machine learning, hallucinations is an actual term for when uh, chat Large language, uh, I can't speak today. Large language models make stuff up. So, uh, because they're not actually attached to any sort of database, they're just predictive text. So, they just do the next likely word in a sentence from what they're trained on. So, uh, they make a lot of stuff up. So, they're going to try to have it not make so much stuff up. Well, as I understand it, they're going to limit the number of um, interactions you can have with, uh, with the chatbot per query yes. um, and also yeah. limit, limit the number of inputs you can give it. But, um, I noticed in a slide that came out of uh, out of PubCon that um, they're also going to be combining um, ChatGPT with uh, with um, actual data out of their out of their search index. Um, that they haven't. I don't know if that's available to the public right now, but it is. If it isn't available now, it's coming very very soon. Um, it is available to a to a select number of testers right now. Um, and so I think the uh, days of it just repeating itself over and over and over again or just repeating itself on pattern are probably over because it's going to be actually responding to user query um, based on the query, not based um, 
but again, Christine, as like Christine said, um, it is still just pulling stuff out of documents that already existed. But then again, that's kind of what a search engine does. <laughs> well, yeah, and I'm not, I have to look into the details of how it's going to work because I haven't seen a lot yet. But the current way that they're pulling in search results is through a parallel process with Orchestrator. So I don't know that they're actually going to attach it to the search results, uh, but we'll have to see. I think it's just going to be improved orchestrator. And the reason for the reduction of prompts and the number of times you can interact on the same prompt is because the longer you go, the more it hallucinates. Yes. So as we've covered before, it told a guy to leave its wife and marry it because it loved him. Uh, so that won't, yep. that won't happen when you can't do more than five prompts at, on one thing, you know, on a prompt set. So, uh, so that'll be really interesting to see. And the, qual- uh, the quality update is going to go live on February 23rd. So at PubCon, well, suppose, yeah, did go. Sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry about that, Christine. I'm just trying to get through this rapid fire because we uh, we have Mika. Um, yes, and, yes. Go uh, ahead. We, we got our guests coming so soon. Okay, so um, at PubCon, um, Gary Ease did what he called a safe presentation, where I'm not, not wanting to get in trouble with Google, um, with his employer at Google. He pulled information that was already publicly available on the web, um, specifically through Wikipedia, about SEO and expanded on what was was already there. And uh, one of the things he expanded on, stuff that Google's already said, so it's, 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 it's not like um, Gary was giving away any secret information at all, because this is stuff that's, that's published on the web and, and through Wikipedia, one of, one of Google's favorite reference points, authorship, links, and disavows. Are uh, are less important than most SEOs think. Uh, I found yeah. I found that quite interesting. Yeah, but <laughs> authorship yeah, definitely because, as we know, Google has said, and the Google doesn't know authors uh, disavows. Yeah, he's saying that people harm themselves more often than they help themselves. Yeah. So I agree with him on that part. Uh, I don't agree that disavows are totally unnecessary because I've had to use them for like site spam uh, and then on uh links i think they just like to say that because they don't want people to, to use links to make links so i think google's trying to back away from the power of links i don't think they have done that i think links right. are still incredibly powerful but google's looking for other ways to uh to 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 find um the quote-unquote truthiness of a website um and yeah people tend to throw throw a lot of uh a lot of uh babies out with dirty bath water when they when they use the disavow tool. Um, it's something that you shouldn't do unless you're absolutely, totally positive you need to, to, to kill those links. Yeah, if you don't have experience with it, get somebody with experience because you could harm your site. And, and even then, the- sorry, even then, <laughs> triple check the list. Yes, yes. And the power of links, I just think they're as powerful as they've ever been, but Google wants people to think they're not so that they won't artificially uh, manipulate them. So I, I think on that one, they might be fudging a little bit. Okay. Um, last story before we jump to our guests, um, and this is this is this is kind of a uh, kind of a a, a, a fun one. Um, so not a fun one, actually. It's kind of a kind of a one that, that really annoys me. Google is blocking news to um, about four percent four percent of um, Canadian users. Why would they do that? Well. Canada has a much smaller media environment than our than our neighbors to the to the south to the United States. We only have about one tenth of the population, and in order to make sure that we're able to tell our stories to ourselves, um, we have some very strict rules on on content. Um, those rules have never been applied to the web. They can't be. I mean, can you can you can you imagine applying um, content rules? like uh, where where content comes from or what story it's selling to the internet, it's very difficult. Right. Nevertheless, the Canadian government is trying to. It's introduced something called uh, uh, Bill C-18 that um, tries very hard to um, recoup some of the uh, monies that are lost by the media to um, uh, uh, Google, Facebook, and other large uh, internet publishers. And also tries, and this is where Google's very angry about YouTube, tries to impose what are called Canadian content rules on uh, on YouTube. Um, a certain amount of video shown in Canada over YouTube should be made by Canadians. That's the way the government's looking at it. Um, Google, YouTube, and many content creators are looking at it a very different way. 
Um, and just like in Australia, Google, just like they tried in Australia, when Google gets angry, they take things away from, uh, from the consumer to punish um, the government. And um, Google is taking away um, a wide swath of Canadian media for, again, a small uh, percentage of Canadians, 4%, but still a fairly sizable group of people. Um, and if you're one of those four um, percent, you're not you're not getting you're not getting content you you may or may 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 not be relying on. That does not sound good. It, well, it doesn't sound good. It'll get worked out. In Australia, it ended up working out. Um, Google, Google, Meta, or or Facebook, um, and the Australian government came up with a deal that favored tended to favor larger scale news operations, but. Um, help them recoup some of the losses of uh of the larger publisher taking their taking their uh, news stories and republishing it over their networks as it works as it tends to work out google might drive traffic to the uh to the newspaper or to the uh tv station that came up with the news gathering organization but that secondary traffic the first touch of the news story tended to go through google servers looking at google's ads not devaluing the ads that could be sold on the site of the uh, news gathering organization. And that's what the government's really reacting to. Uh, it does sound like Google's from their statement are just trying to make a point. They're like, we're concerned about C-18 and it's overly broad. And if unchanged, can impact products Canadians are use, use and rely on every day. That's their statement. Well, and and, and then again, C-18 makes no apology about it. It will impact the products Canadians yeah, use exactly. every day. By, <laughs> that's what it's designed to do. Yeah. Anyway, that would that would require a much longer debate and a much longer show. This is happening. The Canadian government is rather ticked about it. In fact, it's called uh, Google before parliamentary committee to explain what it's doing. Um, more on this if it's actually a story. <laughs> um, we have uh, we have some guests coming up. Um, we do. Now, before we get into this. Um, I want to preface preface the story before Christine introduce our guests. I want to I want to preface the story a little bit. Um, I've never been I, knock on knock on Jim's head. I've never been banned at Facebook. I've never had my account suspended, my rights suspended, my ability to do stuff suspended. I've never even had a post questioned at Facebook that I'm aware of. But a lot of people have, and many people um, have posts removed. Or have their entire account suspended and don't even know why. Um, it was a big problem for um, people um, in the political sphere, um, in uh, the, the especially in the last administration. Um, they even they even invented terms for it called like shadow banning, getting banned for no reason whatsoever. Um, Facebook. Try, has tried to uh, react to and clean up its policies. In fact, it even um, on the on the, this time last week announced a new set of rules they would rather explain than punish. They wrote, Facebook will now remove a post and give up to seven explanations before suspending or suspending or banning users. The new policy is a result of, of analysis and feedback from Meta's Independent oversights board, more severe violations could still mean immediate penalties like posting bans and or account removal. Now, that seems pretty straightforward. And, you know, for people who've been um, banned suddenly uh, by Facebook for whatever reason, this sounds much more reasonable. But for a group of people in the SEO community, recently, like when I say recently, I mean hours after this announcement, mere hours after this announcement came out. A number of moderators of a very popular, um, you know, one of one of those one of those no dumb questions in the community groups, ask ask and we will answer groups. You know, uh, people trying to be helpful. They found themselves banned on mass. Christine, who do we have coming in, and and what happened to these 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 folks? Well, uh, the they woke up and found themselves uh, be completely banned. Uh, from Facebook and Instagram, if they had those accounts, and any other Facebook accounts they had, with no recourse, they're just gone. And basically, the no—I don't remember exactly how it was worded, but they have no recourse. 
And then uh, they also lost the group of 10 years. And this is, uh, I believe the full name of it is Dumb SEO Questions. Does I have that right? No Dumb and, SEO Questions, yep. Yep, and it's just, it was just, everything was eliminated. And they weren't given explanations or recourse at the time, uh, as you said, on the same day that this notification, this from Meta came out. So, and then we have uh, the two guests that I know you're going to intro. So, to talk about this. Well, we have Mika Fisher, um, Vice President of SEO at uh, Turn River Capital and President of the local SEO meetup group, BayAreaSearch.org. Um, Mika's got more than a decade experience in SEO, uh, in e-commerce and, and B2B and uh, serves as a software. We also, I, I, I think we have uh, Masataki Wasa. He's a uh, freelance translator based in London, UK. And um, uh, Mika and Masataki were, um, and I imagine if, 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 if they're still active on Facebook, um, were moderators um, at uh, the, the, the No Dumb Questions um, SEO group. And um, suddenly they were a countless. Um, well, um, Mika, at least I, I know that you're in the you're in the studio. Uh, welcome to uh, welcome to Webcology. Thanks for having me. So, what happened? Oh, and and Masataki, you're here as well. Excellent. Um, what happened to you guys? You woke up, or you turned on uh, your computer to discover your persona non grata at Facebook? Yeah. And I think Masa, you were the first one uh, to notice you, 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 you noticed before me because you, you actually reached out to me via email. Yes. Um, because I found out that my account was banned um, in the morning um, UK time, which would have been very late um, for you. And um, essentially, I noticed that my Instagram account had become inaccessible. And then I was wondering what was happening. And then I received an email from Facebook uh, saying that uh, my account was in violation and that it had asked me to verify my identity by submitting a piece of ID which I did, and almost immediately thereafter, I received another email from Facebook saying that, well, my account is permanently banned, and that's it, or to work to that effect. This is after you complied with their request for, uh, or their demand for uh, an official government ID. Exactly. So I wasn't given the reason why Facebook had suspended my account. Um, it did refer to, the, uh, I think, community standards, but that's a generic reference. There was yeah. nothing specific. It's rather broad as well, indeed. Very yeah, broad. and, and it, the same thing essentially uh, happened to me. So Pacific Coast time morning, I get email. Uh, from Facebook. So that's, that's where essentially um, I had uh, checked on it and um, noticed that yes, basically been locked out, send in your government ID, send the government ID, permaban, immediate email thereafter. Um, on my side, I'm trying to figure out what the heck had happened. Um, Cause yeah, community standards is pretty generic and I'm one, I'm going from, did I like first time in my life outside of the weird global Facebook bug they had, which was like, I've never been in the same case as you, Jim, it was like never had any issues with any posts, you know, temp bans or anything. So like, I'm like, okay, have I been hacked? Have I like, did I post something recently that might've done so, but like, I'm trying to, you know, run through the random things in my mind. Um, and trying to figure out what's been going on until I got Masa's email, where suddenly, like, okay, this is not a specific me thing. Yeah, and I can vouch that you have one of the most non-offending accounts probably that exists on Facebook. It's your kids' chess mm -hmm. and some SEO stuff. So I can't imagine 
you have you violated it but did they give you any information were you able to get anything from them not at the start um the it was the exact same kind of generic part that masa had it was only later that we start to get really different and conflicting information uh, between like myself and a few other admins and moderators uh getting different reasons a few other admins how many admins and moderators from the group lost their uh their profiles we all did uh, okay and they're all getting the same types of messages or different ones different well wow. we're all getting the same ban but then post recovery we were getting different reasons okay were they even the same ballpark or totally different? <laughs> oh, totally different. That's totally the crazy different. part. Um, I don't know if you want me to jump there versus the whole process of getting back and, and what... Do both? Well, yeah, sure. Sure. First off, what are some of the reasons an entire group of mods? I mean, what could, what could the whole group have done? <laughs> yeah, and they lost their Instagram and every other account they had, so it was... All but WhatsApp. All but WhatsApp, okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm also kind of curious, like Masa, what, what made you decide to check? Uh, or was there something that you, you got noticed to go and check about the uh, noting as, as the Facebook group? Um, actually, it was the other admins um, who mentioned in a chat that we had that mm -hmm. they had their account banned. So initially, I thought it was just me. And I was happily uploading my ID, hoping that that would solve it. But no, I was permanently banned. And then I found out that a couple of others were from the group um, stating the same. So then I reached out to Micah, and we found out that essentially the group is gone completely. And given that four, five, six of us and the only common thing we had really was the group, we sort of came to the conclusion that it must have been something to do with the group. But there was no indication at all that such was the case from the communication we had from Meta Facebook. Now, the, the group was removed as well, right? Correct. And how long had the group been around? On Facebook, it's Generally. been... Uh, well, generally, we've, it's been like a decade now since back in the days of Google Plus. Um, so, so that take, takes you takes you a little bit back. Facebook's probably like eight ish, eight five eight years, probably. Yeah, and so a long time. Had anything? I mean, and, and, and I, I think I already know the answer to this. But I'm going to ask anyway. Had anything untoward ever happened on the group? Anything that might get somebody banned? I mean, we've we've kicked people out for various spam. We've had we have active moderators. Okay. Now, um, it, it's not to say like all of us were active. Like myself, I was less active with with actual moderation. So, um, but there were others who were. So we had people, and we had members in there who would report stuff to us, and we you know take action. So it was an active group dealing with that situation but it was also a public and open to the web type you know seo group on facebook too okay so theoretically some creep could have posted something awful there but as you said it's a well moderated group i know one of your moderators was was ammon john who is a mm -hmm. veteran in in moderate uh moderate he, he was he was moderating forums before many people uh who program facebook were born <laughs> um so, so he's a he, he Amon is, is a very talented guy. He got caught in this sweep. Um, yeah. I guess the, the, the next question is, are you back? Is the group back? And how did you get back? Yeah. So pretty much all of us are back except for um, Amon, who essentially refused to upload his ID. Mm -hmm. um, and Michael Martinez... Uh, and we don't know why technically for that one. Um, okay. I was talking to Michael the other day. Weird. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So that, that it may have been, so this is where I think there, there are there basically a lot of bugs with the system. And I think it might've been a timing thing 
where because he hadn't submitted, he may not have been able to get back. So those of us who submitted re uh, approval or submitted our IDs and all that stuff got back in, but because he probably did it after the time period of them putting us all back, he may be in some weird bug limbo is, is one possibility. Is the group back? Yes. Did Facebook say they're sorry? Yes and no. Um, <laughs> this is, so to give you, basically what happened is, is I used a connection um, that I knew that in, was able to get us a, a, essentially a human review of it. That was the fortune that I had was the, some an actual like uh, friend who could help in that regard. And that's, that's where turning from an algorithmic auto ban to, hey, let's take a look. And that's what, that essentially is what I believe got us out of this situation. Um, but then we had a lot of bugs. So for example, um, some in the group, like I believe Masa, um, just got back in. No, no details, no nothing. There might've been like a Facebook notification about something, but he couldn't click in to see what it was. Um, another person, another moderator got an actual emailed apology that it was, a, it was an, it was a mistake. I got a really odd one where they blamed that I, my old Facebook page, this is the old, like your pre-business profiles and the follow stuff, like, like a very, very old Facebook page, um, had supposedly, even though it was literally just a picture of me at 30 years old like child sex exploitation images wow okay and so i'm like uh that's me at 30 what <laughs> like <laughs> and it's like a facebook page uh, or like the old facebook page it's not even like the facebook group so like i'm like okay and so like that was weird um and so we had a variety of different reasons and so my guess out of this is that the facebook situation in the group must have been something that got triggered that we guess didn't capture it quickly enough and the bug transferred that over to something else that i had on like my facebook page um just having a face an old facebook page regardless so they're like well it wasn't the profile we'll just throw it to some other random thing so that's where i think some bug came in that's extraordinary and yeah. the, the 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 reason I think that that, that both Christine and I are so triggered on this on this story when it came up was um the arbitrariness of it the 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 the, the, the you got you got obviously caught in some uh, big net sweep that uh, you should not have been caught in but people's person people's uh, businesses their um reputations can be badly damaged by this kind of foolish mistake. Um, and I'm, I'm just curious how easy or difficult Facebook made it for you to, you know, remedy the situation. Well, I mean, if you don't have, if you didn't have a connection, I don't know if we could have gotten back in. I mean, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, that's very likely true. It, it's, it's just amazing that like, you know, they effectively did not look at any of our personal histories. They just saw something in the group didn't care that the moderation was there and just said everyone who's an admin everyone who's a moderator banned done and kill the group that's it like there was no no warnings no you know uh you, you know no warnings like hey you need to do a better job type of thing um no posts like here's what it was and why um it, nothing was was given clarity but it was like that's scary as like your personal connections to all your stuff of like messenger and Instagram and all that as, as us being our personal accounts for the moderation of this Facebook group to just blanket ban across the board. Like, um, not all of us were theoretically uh, as invested or still as involved with the group. It's like, you know, if you leave your Facebook group, but, or leave you just forget that you're even an admin it's like okay well um shoot <laughs> so uh how long did it take you guys to back up all your facebook and instagram data <laughs> <laughs> could you back up all your facebook and like what if you did you take all your stuff 
down down offline off of Facebook, so at least you have it on a hard drive somewhere in case this happens to you again. Uh, they do provide a link, so you could download all your data. I don't know, Masa. Did you did you do that? Because I I mean I didn't since I was spending the day trying to figure out all that stuff. But I did, but I'm not so sure what exactly you get from that link. Um, the problem is I'm not an active user of Facebook, so I don't have much. Um, so it's you essentially get a zip file of. I think all the pages that you had on Facebook, um, but I'm not so sure if it if it has everything as it were. I, I just think of all the things that people use Facebook for in their personal lives: um, images, uh, birthday reminders, contact lists, etc. And mm-hmm. to lose all that so- suddenly would be. Um, Per, a big personal loss, and as Christine just said in the background, it could also be a massive business loss. Yeah, I was, <laughs> I was, I have a kind of a pattern I do on my phone every day of like checking through different uh, networks and emails and news and stuff. And like, even though I knew I was banned, I was still like try to open up like Facebook <laughs> Messenger or something. I'm like, oh right, I'm banned. Like that, <laughs> even within the few hours. And so it was just one of those things where it's was so ingrained and then suddenly it's like oh <laughs> hey, gentlemen um i'm glad you're both back i'm so, so sorry that this, this happened to you but thank you for coming on to tell your story um um masataki wasa freelance translator um based in london uk and uh, mika fisher vice president of seo at turn river capital um and and uh again uh president of a seo uh, meetup group bay area search thank you both for uh for for coming on yeah, thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank and, you. Uh, best of luck in the future, eh? Mm. Okay, <laughs> friends, um, that was um, uh, Mika and Masataki. They uh, are moderators of the um, uh, No Dumb Questions SEO group at Facebook. The group is back, so if you have any dumb questions, well, they're not dumb questions. If you have any questions, ask them. There's people who are going to answer them, and there's people who want to help in this industry. And... Uh, yeah, it just, just drives me crazy when stuff like this happens, eh? Yeah, it's so it's so incredibly damaging. I've had silly things that mine has been banned for for like seven days or thirty days, and like one day I was had a meeting with someone, and all the information was in Messenger, and I couldn't get to Messenger anymore. I couldn't show up for the meeting, and that's where the contact info was as well. So it's very damaging. It's not just that people post food photos anymore, right? It's like it's integrated with our work lives and our meeting schedules and, you know, I'm sure people's soccer teams. And so getting a ban with no recourse. And if Mika did not have an internal contact, there would have been no yeah. recourse. Yeah. So it's a very, it's very serious thing. And we, and it's not a light, uh, just, I can't post my food pics anymore. So it's a big deal. Well, again, I'm, I'm, I'm glad they've got it worked out. And um, yeah. for, for people who are listening, um, take care with your data and don't rely on a system that could just, ban you like to have your information you there's a reason um we believe in redundancies and double redundancies in this in this industry um i think uh uh, uh masataki and uh, mika just reminded us of it okay this now now we're moving into the fun part of the show we have um tom uh tom wrestling who is the founder of audience key and sponsor of this show sponsor of webcology Tom has spent the last 19 years in progressive roles as a marketing director, SEO consultant, search marketing agency leader. He's the founder of Audience Key, an SEO strategy platform to get markers out of the disconnected SEO project spreadsheets and into a centralized end-to-end data-connected system for planning, developing, implementing, and measuring. Um, and again, Tom is also the sponsor of this show, Webcology. Tom Russling. You were also in Austin just uh, earlier this week. Welcome to Webcology. Thank you so much. Nice to uh, speak with both of you, Jim and Christine, and thanks for having me. So first off, how was how was PubCon? It was great. You know, I think everyone was was hungry to be there, and and definitely, it's always a reunion. But when uh, that kind of unexpected time has elapsed. It makes it that much sweeter and people appreciate uh, seeing each other that much more on yeah. top of it. Um, you know, you could say that 
the sessions year to year were, you know, started to have a lot of overlap and suddenly there's bigger disruption as we all know than any of us have seen in a long time and a lot of fertile ground and a lot of very early emerging ideas how uh you know all the ai ai uh technology is is changing workflows and content and just everything programming so well, i imagine yeah i imagine there was a great deal of overflow content at, at this this version <laughs> of upcon because ai is everywhere yeah yeah. How does that, as a tool, as a tool maker, how do you feel about the AI revolution? Um, well, I always embrace flux, right? Because I think that that creates. It's always brings <clears throat> introduces you know a level of uncertainty and scariness, but it's also opens up opportunity. And uh, so I think um, you know we're we're all collectively figuring this out. But uh, I love it. And, you know, particularly, you know, for the software that um, I've been building for the last many years, um, it's really dedicated around uh, strategy. And so um, at the end of the day, in certain ways, you could look at this for content creation as it's it may start to in some angles. And I'll, I don't want to upset people, but it could start to create the perception of commoditizing content creation to an extent and the way to get away from that commoditization is strategy and so as a strategy platform i i think that actually helps accentuate uh you know our value proposition so i'm uh i'm hopeful one of the, one <laughs> of the things one of the things i've been i've been advising my clients recently especially ones that have you know, the, the herkin uh e-com sites you know the the, the 25,000 plus product e-com sites um google has come out with its helpful content uh, uh algorithms or it's help, it's helpful content uh, uh i don't know if you can call this a full algorithm or just a uh saying <laughs> or something but google's obviously wanting um website owners uh, and, and, and e-tailers to really, really invest in content. And when you're doing it at scale, you can't, you know, this is, this is AI was built to work at scale, but you can't be publishing AI content just unedited. Um, audience key, especially the side-by-side um, editing suite, seems perfect for, uh, for working with like large amounts of, of, of uh, AI written content. That's right. I think one of the kind of neat terms I picked up uh, at the conference just a few days ago was they were calling it, I think, like uh, an AI sandwich. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Where we as humans are the bread. And so it starts with like humans and kind of the strategy and the pre-writing, you know, outline and what you want to do with it. And then you can use AI, but then you got to put bread on the other side of it, too. Right. And so it comes back to uh, human human kind of review, editing, tweaking. Um, <clears throat> our uh, director of content, I think, as we started playing around with this stuff uh, a while back, said it really well. She's like, I would never let this, you know, do the, the final writing by any means. But she's like, I never have writer's block anymore. <laughs> I'm you know, even stuck for a minute, have it write something and it sparks my thinking and ideas of how to now say it the right way. And I thought that's a really great way to look at it. I'm, I'm a content writer by trade. Um, that's, that's the, the bulk of my business is, is uh, writing content for other people's websites. And I agree. I absolutely agree with you. Director of content could never go off my desk if it was uh, straight AI written. But oh my goodness, it's a speed up the process. You got to get you got to get uh, twenty five hundred words out. Um, if two thousand of them are written by AI, and you can augment the uh, the other fifth of it uh, to make it read like a real human would write it, um, and make it more useful to the audience it's written for, um, I think it's a it's a no brainer. That's an important component too, is useful because before the helpful content update came out, John kept talking to people on Twitter about their non indexed content as needing to be not just good anymore, but useful. 
And straight AI content isn't really useful or unique because it's just synthesizing and summarizing what already exists through predictive text. Can't add, it can't create, it can't, it can't add insights. So if you don't have that human component, it could be said that your content's really not that helpful. So. Well, and this is, this is why I keep, keep going back to, um, and this is, it's unfortunately for, um, this is, this is a radio show, not a television show. So it's really hard to show <laughs> the side-by-side -side editor. Um, there is a free trial of audience key. And when you do use the free trial, use the side-by-side -side editor. I'm telling you, it will, yeah. it will honestly change the way you look at content. The only, the only way you can get close to uh, experiencing the side-by-side -side editor without any of the features that come with audience key is to have two monitors set up beside each other. And yeah, you have to have... I'm sorry, I didn't interrupt. I was I'm say, sorry, but, even, but then you're not getting all the features that come with the software. Yeah, I was just saying that that side by side is great because you do have to have that human component. So it's great to be able to see the two together. So when you were at PubCon, Tom, um, I mean, you 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 you, all, you obviously were, were were talking of the product, talking of audience key. Um, how how to say this? Um, you went there with. Uh, with with audience key as built now, um, uh, 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 was the, is there pressure from people you're talking to to go full throttle into AI to incorporate it into everything? Um, yeah, that's a really common question. Um, it's a complicated one to ask too. I'm so I'm sorry if I phrased that wrong. No, 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 not at all. You know, even even before kind of this like wider spread um awareness of of you know ai content machines and this and that we're constantly getting asked well wait can i just press a button will it do everything for me <laughs> you know so this is just an, <laughs> an extension of that pattern of conversations i've had for a long time and we've always kind of had the mantra of as as something that's built to help turn like a large keyword, you know, research portfolio into an entire strategic plan and how to organize your content architecture and understand how to optimize pages, not just within themselves, but across how they fit into all the other pages you have. Um, you know, this isn't something that it's going to do all that for you. It's going to help the uh, most important SEO tool there is on the planet, which is the person sitting in front of the keyboard um, just do their job better, faster, and put the right kind of data and insights in front of them at the right moment for making good decisions. Um, Tom, oh, sorry. Yeah. I, was just gonna, I just want to ask you real quick. Um, I know from just briefly, you know, using your tool that it kind of has this great synthesis of a lot of different tasks other tools do separately. Can you kind of explain the flow? of how it works? Sure. I mean, there's a few different use cases, but um, to think about it, like in a holistic sense, uh, it starts with uh, keyword mapping software that we built. So the idea is you build out like a large data set of, um, of your, your keyword research. And that's often coming from an amalgamation of sources. It can come from your Google search console, SEMrush, Ahrefs, you know, name your tool. And then you can also start to pull in data from um, competitor sites and you bring all that together. And now the keyword mapping software really starts with identifying like every kind of cluster of terms should ideally be supported by one primary page on your site. So two things happen, right? Either um, when you go through that mapping keywords to a specific URL, you map them to a page you have or you realize there's not really an appropriate page you have currently, so you start mapping them to pages you need to develop. Um, and going through that exercise, our system is built that you can only map a, a particular keyword to one page. And so if you kind of in an unintentionally have multiple pages that might be optimized around the same thing, it forces those hard but important decisions. So how to kind of take a large data set of keywords, organize and map that to your page structure, figure out the pages you want to optimize, the pages that you're missing that you need to build, 
And then our system <clears throat> generates from each of those mappings its own individual content brief that's broken down into um, a strategy area, which is really useful for collaboration and pre-writing use. <clears throat> so you can outline, share any information you want with uh, the people that are maybe producing the content. Uh, the next part of it is an optimization area. And that's what Jim was alluding to, that side-by-side. -side. So if it's an existing page, our system will pull in the published content and create a baseline. And now you can kind of clone that and get a side-by-side -side and get scoring on, you know, with the view right in front of you of keywords that you've mapped to that page and how well are those keywords supported by the baseline content. And then you can start, again, on the right side of the screen start making kind of a more optimized version <clears throat> and you get that scoring feedback. So you start, it, it gives a little bit of a gamification, but it gives kind of real-time feedback. And what we find in optimizing an existing page, it's not, it's kind of like an iterative process. You keep kind of finding things that you could do a little better, be a little more descriptive, um, utilize your, your header text better. And you keep kind of saving and getting scoring feedback and, you know, three, four, five, six iterations in, you start to be pretty happy and with kind of some of the insights you've gotten and some of the changes you've made. Um, so that's that kind of part of it. It's pulling in all your keyword data, um, lets you score your keywords for relevancy to know like you might have 20 keywords mapped to a page, but some are relatively more important than others. And that's helps inform what goes into the title tag, the H1s, et cetera. And then the last, also all the SERP feature that's included in each keyword. <clears throat> so you can really understand that. And if there's a lot of like um, uh, PAA keywords and that type of thing informs maybe, you know, how you want to kind of do a call and response kind of structure to your content. And then the last piece, uh, and I'm going to, well, I'm going to skip over a publishing thing and come back to it because I did want to talk about Edge SEO. But then the last kind of piece there that we originally built was a place for um, measurement. So baselining, we, we track <clears throat> keyword rankings on a weekly basis. So you have a baseline of where you are. And then you can see progressively week over week <clears throat> how your, uh, your rankings are starting to, you know, improve, you know, the particular keywords that are associated to that page. Um, and so in doing that, you can also look at your competitive competitor data and how they're doing. And you can look at how have I grown in nominal terms from like my own benchmark, but you can also look at how much maybe more impression share am I getting now than I did three months ago. All that data connected so that, you know, our goal is to really help um, SEO strategists get out of uh, like spreadsheets, like they get more complex and crazy and put everything into like a system that's connected and provides really interesting feedback loops. <clears throat> Cause once you've optimized a page and you kind of let it bake for 60, 90 days, you can see what's worked and maybe what's fallen short. And you can look at things like what's the ranking URL versus the mapped URL. The mapped URL is like your strategic ideal. The ranking URL is what Google is saying is their reality. And you can start to look at those disconnects or the terms that you were trying to support on a particular page that fell short. And that informs that like optimization cycle of, well, now I either need to go back and tweak the page further, or maybe my mapping strategy was off. And I need to take these terms that weren't as successful as I wanted and maybe remap them to a more explicit new page of content. That makes sense. Yeah, totally. And it's such a well because uh, we can't show people <laughs> right it's uh it is so well designed like I, I used to do a lot of UI UX I'm super critical of it and I find uh, your product is really got easy flow to it it's really simple to use easy to understand which is kind of super important in a in something like this no, I appreciate that I, and I think the other thing I kind of glossed over but inside of like that whole system is workflow technology for strategy. And that's kind of an interesting thing that I feel is just kind of was missing out there. Um, so that means being able to um, assign various stakeholders to a particular page. 
um, and then have statuses, not for just like your writing workflow, which we do handle, but also even your strategy workflow. So you've got a URL, it's a page that doesn't exist, you explore it. And then you analyze that and you think that's a good idea. And if you're working with a, a team or you're an agency, um, putting together like proposed ideas to clients, you can put all those non-existing pages into a proposed status, let them vet that, and they can move, you know, give you feedback and they or you can move that from proposed to either planned or they can dismiss it or they can sideline it and come back to it later, put target dates on everything. And then from there also start to put um, kind of workflow um, statuses into the content brief strategy. So is this like explored? Are we collaborating it? Is this like a kind of a completed pre-writing strategy? And then also all the workflow for writing, assigning to writers, what the writing status is, you know, assigned, written, edited, approved, revision, et cetera, which is, you know, all the common things that you'd see in any type of a content production workflow. And again, this is all being uh, coordinated and deployed from the tool. Yes. And that's the whole point of like, if you start to try and do that in, uh, in spreadsheets, and we certainly were, I mean, that was the kind of inspiration behind this. Um, it just gets more and more complex and, and difficult uh, for people to ascertain. So yeah, it puts all kind of the workflow of that strategic process, which is there's so many steps when you really break it down and it just puts it all together. Well, moreover, I, 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 I do live in uh, spreadsheets and pivot tables and I got to share my, my work with my clients. I got, I, I want to give them a, um, almost an itemized list of what I've done. And when you live in the world of spreadsheets, um, A, you have to make another spreadsheet to do that. And B, um, it's just so much, so many files going back and forth, things get lost and they fall off the desk or they don't even, they, they, they get unattached during email or whatever. And people um, this also seems love to simpler. start adding co- new columns and new this and that, and and then you have no <laughs> uniformity, right? So yeah. there's a whole host of issues of things that are just like when pieces become disconnected, right? So how hard is it? This is this is something that that that, that I'm going to be struggling with. Um, I'm certainly going to be going to be using Audience Key in the future, but I'm really worried about changing habits. Like I am a creature of habit, like most people in our industry, and. Um, yeah, um, that's 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 my one. I remember when when work product productivity software started coming in, like counting your hours and stuff. It, I I was one of the last holdouts to start using it, and now it is such an amazing component in my business. Um, how do you deal with that? Like people not wanting to change their habits. Do do you have any um, incentives or do you say gamification ways to move old codgers like me into the into the future? <laughs> no, it's. I think it's one of the best questions you can ask. And uh, I think it's our, one of our biggest challenges. So the best kind of correlation I can give that to is, is like, I'm sure most of the people listening um, use some type of a project management software. And most people who have done that have probably gone through false starts with that, you know, and then there's, there's a cost to, a project management software, but the real cost is actually getting operational workflow and, and buy-in from everyone. So they're kind of using it effectively and it's as good as the adoption is. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah. And anytime you introduce change into an organization, it's hard. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, I admittedly, like that's one of the things that we're still working with, you know, how can we, best help that adoption. Um, Generally, what we try to do is say, don't like use this right out of the gate to totally change everything you're doing, but try using this on uh, like a certain small project or just in one area of of a site you're working on and just experience it. Because once people start to see how much clearer and connected everyone is to what's going on between like the strategic planning and the development and the implementation and the result monitoring. Um, That that's when I think you get that aha moment and then they're eager to, um, to now like, wow, it would be crazy to do 
to do the, the what we're doing, you know, without this for for the rest of the thing. So it's it's baby stepping people in. I oh, think indeed. It's the, is the best way to look at it. Um, we've had uh, several agencies come up with what I now think is a great idea. Where they're like, well, let's kind of dog food this by using this for our own website first and get comfortable. You know, does this do what we think it's going to do? Is it going to be awesome or not? Are we going to, but um, you know, once they get comfortable kind of doing it on their own site, they see the application and they're usually eager to, now start applying that to um, their client projects. And it's okay. certainly most easiest if you kind of start maybe with the next new project that you're bringing in, you know, versus trying to reverse course on something where you're, you know, six months a year or whatever into an engagement. Well, and and for what it's worth, I always find like, you know, as a uh, older tech worker, I um, tend to be slow to adopt, to adopt, uh, work uh work enhancers uh work assisters but every time i do they really 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 improve my own they improve my own productivity and improve my game and improve the output from 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 my desk and ultimately that's what we're trying to do yeah exactly and i I think the other thing is that um our our system is certainly a core tenant of it is the concept of keyword mapping And what I've found in speaking to a lot of SEO teams, whether they're agencies or in-house, they'll often claim that they're doing that. But when you kind of get a little bit of an understanding, they're not doing maybe a very thorough or well-developed process yet. And so that's also part of that education, you know, and, and getting like them to maybe subscribe to that. I can tell you personally, um, as someone who's like that's core to how I you know look at or approach any type of um SEO project now, I can't figure out how I would do it otherwise. And um, that's like, you know, but but that's like one of these things, the more I've done it, the and the more experienced I've gotten it, and I can say the same conclusions from our team members, all who are like veteran, veteran, you know, SEO and digital marketers. Um it changes the way you think about it and it's kind of impossible to do it any other way. Once, once that becomes uh, it kind of like it, it kind of formats your thinking and your, your paradigm of looking at things. Well, indeed in, in my 21 years in the business, I've only come across one SEO who comes even close to what audience key does in the way of keyword mapping. And his whole business is keywords. That's, that's it. That's, that's, that's his niche in SEO. Yeah. Um, and he, and, and he does stuff that none of the rest of us want to do. <laughs> um, keyword selection, keyword mapping is one of the harder parts of the, of, of the task. Cause it's just of the, of the job, just because it is so, um, how does, how to say it? It just, it can go on forever. It's arduous. Arduous. That's the right word for it. It can go on <laughs> yeah, forever. That's a good word for it. Yeah. Well, and, you know, there's there's two points I want to make. So one is that what this allowed us to do, a lot of what the system does, um, we as a team were doing this in spreadsheets, and I felt like our strategists were spending 75% of their time organizing and updating data instead of being strategic. And so this does all that, like, everything's connected. And so you're not spending almost any time updating data. You're just doing the things that got you interested in, you know, this career to begin with. But the fun part, <laughs> the joy of it. Yeah. And it has um, a good workflow process to it. So you're not going in and out of tools, changing your train of thought, things like that. So you can kind of stay in that mode where you're creating and not handling, like you said, handling data. Yeah. And for larger teams, it's centralizing a strategic place so that you understand maybe, you know, someone else is responsible for a different area of a site. This becomes extremely germane for enterprises where they might have different divisions handling different areas of a website, but they, they're all kind of, they all have to be coordinated and not oh. kind of blurring and cannibalizing each other. 
Tom, this happens to us every week, and Christina told you this was going to happen. We are down <laughs> to our last, like, like 60 seconds. You want to talk about NHSEO, and I don't yeah. even know if we've gotten there yet. Um, so quickly, if, if, you can throw, if you can get the NHSEO part in. Sure. So in what kind of was like an offshoot of what we built, um, we started wanting to be able to uh, – do some things uh, inside, I'll give an example, inside like a closed in um, CMS like Shopify, where I'm a big believer in, I put a premium uh, of importance on URL taxonomy and being able to uh, control, control like a lot of the elements and and build in extra content components and, and enhance internal linking. So uh, you can't do all those things inside of certain closed end systems or enterprise, you know, kind of home built systems. Edge SEO is outside of the AI content stuff is the most mind bending thing I've come across um, in my SEO career. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a much longer conversation. <laughs> essentially you can, um, we built a way to uh, integrate all like the content and technical fields that we wanted to add uh, to publish from our system into Cloudflare. And you can use Cloudflare workers to basically um, act as a middle ground between the origin server and what the user agent uh, request is getting. And so instead of going straight from origin to user, you can simply um, you can intercept that and then uh, with audience key or any kind of a headless CMS, or there's a few ways to do it, you can then override um, URL structure. You can add in additional content fields. You can change title tags. You can do massive quantities of redirects, um, you know, for hreflang or anything like that without putting any additional taxing on the origin server, as well as uh, it creates a static kind of version of a page if you're, you know, heavy into JavaScript. And it kind of creates a flat file that ends up being like a fully complete red rendered page. It's usually faster, lighter, and maybe I maybe I get a chance to come back and talk a little more detail because it's there's so many um, interesting things that it solves. So for the non tech people, real quick, you can bypass the devs, do the work on the server. It creates a static HTML file that goes out there, so you don't have to wait for the process internally to your company to get the work done. You can get it done on the edge. You said and, that so much better than I did. And <laughs> no, in the headless well environment, you you'll likely yes. get a better result and a better render at the end of the day. That's very true. A headless. lot more control and consistency on that. Exactly. Head, headless is heartless. So get, get, get the good <laughs> renders when you can. Headless is heartless. I like that. <laughs> uh, Tom Rustling. Um, founder of, uh, of audience key Ma- and and sponsor of webcology uh thank you so much for joining us uh that was that was a, that was a really fun session um we're gonna have you on again uh guaranteed but i wish we had a little bit more time today but unfortunately we have gone full clock so on behalf of uh christian Shackinger from sites without walls this is jim hedger from digital always media friends you were listening to webcology on wmr.fm on recorded live to podcast on the 2nd of March, 2023, be kind to each other, rank well, use good tools because they make your job better, stay safe, and uh, yeah, as I said, be kind to each other. Uh, on behalf of Christine, we'll, um, have a good week. We'll talk to you this time next week. Bye, everybody. The opinions expressed on this program are those of the guests and hosts and do not necessarily reflect those of WebmasterRadio.fm's management or sponsors. Any rebroadcast or redistribution without authorized consent of WebmasterRadio.fm is prohibited.